democracy should actually go into government, that politicians should listen to psychiatrists, psychiatrists should be in every parliament and should direct and monitor political activities. Psychiatry, in little more than a century, has infiltrated society on a global scale, and not by accident. People aren't aware that in 1940, a prominent British psychiatrist, Colonel J.R. Rees, addressed the National Council on Mental Hygiene and set the agenda for psychiatry for the next 60 years. Since then, psychiatrists have been given authority in nearly every sector of our society, with tragic results. We must aim to make it permeate every educational activity in our national life. Public life, politics and industry should all of them be within our sphere of influence. We have made a useful attack upon a number of professions. The two easiest of them naturally are the teaching profession and the church. The most difficult are law and medicine. Reese's colleague, psychiatrist G. Brock Chisholm, co-founder of the World Federation for Mental Health, later expanded upon psychiatry's plans. To achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism, loyalty to family traditions, national patriotism, and religious dogmas. To implement their master plan, American psychiatrists convinced the U.S. Congress that mental illness was a national threat that only they with vast increases in funding could solve. And thus began massive U.S. government expenditures for psychiatric research, which have climbed from $1 million a year in 1946 to $1.4 billion today, an increase of more than 139,000%. As psychiatric influence spread across America, it also spread throughout the world. Behind crisis after world crisis, you'll find the handiwork of psychiatry. Example, Serbian psychiatrist Jovan Ruskovic, who demanded the ethnic cleansing of Croats and Muslims because of his firm belief in their racial inferiority. The result, Bosnia in the 1990s, where Ruskovic's colleague, psychiatrist Radovan Karadzic, and Prime Minister Slobodan Milosevic established Balkan concentration camps where the mass torture, rape, and murder of the innocent happened once more. One military psychiatrist explained how it was done. C'est très difficile tuer uh, millions de personnes. C'est très difficile, techniquement difficile. Les Allemands étaient bons techniciens Et il ne pouvait pas, euh, il pouvait seulement euh, 6 millions de juifs exterminés. Il massacre, par exemple, 100 ou 200 de personnes, ou euh, viole 100 euh, femmes et 100 jeunes filles, pour que les autres soient effrayés et échappent. Alors vous avez le terrain pur. With century-old Pavlovian conditioning, coupled with modern-day mind control techniques, psychiatrists and psychologists can turn average men, and even children, into mass murderers. You could train them to use firearms indiscriminately. You could train them to shoot people with very little feeling or thought. You could train them to use abusive and brutalizing procedures in order to obtain information with no hesitancy, with no concern. This is how terrorists are created. In the wake of 9-11, Osama bin Laden was characterized as the mastermind behind the attacks. But the acknowledged brain trust and commander of Al-Qaeda is Ayman al-Zawahri, educated in psychology and pharmacology at the University of Cairo, and the author of the Al-Qaeda training manual on the use of coercive psychiatry. And orchestrating the terrorist bombings in Madrid, Abu Hafiza, another Al-Qaeda operative, relying on those same techniques to manipulate the minds of men. You can implant memories. Memories are potent sources of motivated behavior. If you implant enough memories of specific kinds, you can shape and change the nature of human thinking, 
and feelings. And it was thought to be a kind of ultimate weapon because what greater weapon could there be than control of the human mind? You can control minds and you can move people around, particularly when you control their lives. It's easier to control their minds. When we look at, uh, at psychiatry and psychology, social control is the primary agenda. And that agenda is being put in place throughout the world right now, using mental health screening campaigns fed to the public under such innocuous sounding names as Teen Screen. The national government is actually encouraging it and wanting to test every single kid in our public school system. All children are put under this kind of a test for psychiatric evaluation, a 10-minute test that tells them absolutely nothing. I predict that upwards of 90% of all the people screened will be diagnosed as having a psychiatric disorder, which means that we'll have an entire generation that will be a perfect profit center. The man behind the teen screen program, psychiatrist David Schaefer, consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense. They're not just uh, screening children to have complete control of the 52 million children in school. They're screening now, and that bill, they will screen uh, their parents, and they will screen all adults in America. The idea of mass screening for mental illness in the American population, run by a government initiative, is one of the scariest ideas I ever heard of. Psychiatry is politics, has always been politics. It is politics pure and simple, because politics, psychiatry was always the application of force against people who don't want to be forced. It's a sad thing, and parents better wake up. Society better wake up, because we're in serious trouble if they don't. Psychiatry's master plan to infiltrate all sectors of society is becoming a reality. We don't have an epidemic of mental illness. We have an epidemic of psychiatry. Something can and must be done about it. Founded in 1969 by the Church of Scientology, the Citizens Commission on Human Rights investigates and exposes psychiatric violations of human rights. From its international headquarters in Los Angeles, California, CCHR documents psychiatry's invasive and destructive practices and publishes its findings, making them available in some 15 languages. More than 8 million copies have been distributed to healthcare professionals, government officials, educators, and business leaders world over. The headquarters is also the site of the world-renowned exhibit, Psychiatry, an Industry of Death. Centered around 14 documentary films, this state-of-the-art exhibition presents the history of psychiatry, from its origins, where the mentally ill were caged like animals, to the present-day mass drugging of society as the cure for invented mental disorders. Traveling versions of the exhibit visit hundreds of cities across five continents, opening the way for hundreds of thousands to discover for themselves the dark truth behind psychiatry. What is today a global human rights movement began more than 30 years ago with a fight for the freedom of one individual, Victor Giori, forcibly committed to a Pennsylvania psychiatric hospital. He was interviewed by a psychiatrist who said, I can't understand a word this man is saying. He's incoherent. Obviously, a paranoid schizophrenic. Commit him, which they did. Now, he wasn't babbling incoherently, he was speaking Hungarian. We filed a lawsuit against the hospital. In the middle of the case, the doctor who was the head of the hospital stands up and he says, we want nothing more to do with Victor Giori. The release of Victor Giori was the first of thousands of cases throughout the world helped by CCHR. 
CCHR challenged involuntary commitment laws throughout the United States and internationally. And what we found was that people were being incarcerated without any legal rights. They had no right to an attorney. They could be drugged, shocked, lobotomized without their consent. Example, Australia 1977, where CCHR exposed a psychiatric practice called deep sleep treatment. Patients were being knocked unconscious with a cocktail of barbiturates and other psychiatric drugs and they were being subjected to electroshock treatment daily, sometimes twice daily, without their knowledge. Deep sleep treatment had led to 48 deaths. It was CCHR that investigated it, exposed it and fought for over a decade until deep sleep treatment was banned. In South Africa, CCHR exposed psychiatric camps where mental patients were kept and brutalized and then farmed out as slave labor. In Italy, CCHR worked with legislators and the media conducting raids on psychiatric hospitals, the conditions of which were barbaric, and CCHR got them shut down. In Japan, CCHR exposed the financial crimes of psychiatrists and hospitals that were defrauding the government and taxpayers. The guilty were tried and the hospitals put out of business. And in the United States, CCHR uncovered a billion dollar fraud in the nation's largest chain of private mental health facilities. 600 federal agents conducted raids across 20 states. Dozens of prosecutions ensued, millions in fines imposed and the entire chain of corrupt hospitals was bankrupted and permanently closed. And behind every public warning you see today about psychiatric drugs is CCHR. CCHR has documented the side effects of these drugs, has taken evidence to the FDA, has gone to Congress, has obtained congressional hearings. It took 13 years before the FDA finally admitted that those drugs can cause suicide and issued black box warnings. We got nine state laws passed. Following that, it was the introduction of the Child Medication Safety Act in 2004. In the last three years alone, there have been more than 50 international drug regulatory agency warnings exposing the dangers of psychiatric drugs. History has told us every workable method that could be used to help people who are seriously disturbed, who do need some sort of treatment, has been suppressed and smashed by the vested interests of psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry. The public's largely been getting their information from the industry that benefits on putting them on psychiatric drugs. It's an advertising campaign. It's not science, it's marketing. CCHR is causing things to change by being champions for a growing number of well-intentioned people who are risking their professional careers to speak up against the abuses of psychiatry. Having that support from a group like this has made a tremendous difference in what I feel personally that I've been able to accomplish. So I think of CCHR as, as fellow soldiers. I'm unaware of any other organization that does the kind of work that CCHR does, particularly on the, the scope and the level that they do. CCH R has been very effective at moving the ball down the field, one at a time, one state at a time, one legislator at a time. CCHR has had the resources to be able to teach and have legislators become more aware of what the problem with the psychotropic drugs are. CCHR has researched the issue. When you need the facts, you go to CCHR. Today, CCHR has over 300 chapters in dozens of countries around the world. Wherever and whenever psychiatrists abuse human rights, CCHR takes its message to the streets. From the United States to Japan, and from Canada to the United Kingdom, prominent members of CCHR lead marches to secure the protection and freedom from psychiatric abuse for everyone. It's essential that CCHR does their job and gets the support to do their job, because the extent to which they do the whole vehicle that's out of control about psychiatry gets to be contained and gets to be eliminated. It scares me to think if this doesn't happen. I've seen up close what it's like, and it scares the daylights out of me. You have 100,000 people electroshocked every year. You have 17 million children worldwide taking mind-altering drugs. You have people being involuntarily committed every 75 seconds, and it's all under the guise of mental health. The only way that you are going to get humane treatment into the mental health system is to take psychiatry and the vested interests out of the picture.